years in the spotlight, though. Marilyn allowed only two women to photograph her, and now, 25 years later, one of them, Eve Arnold, has put together her shots of Norma Jean. Many of them have never been seen before in a book she calls Marilyn Monroe and Appreciation. Eve Arnold joins us this morning. The significance of two women is more that there weren't that many women photographers exactly. Exactly. than that she preferred men photographers to take pictures of her. I don't think it mattered as long as there was a camera there. It didn't matter. How did she find you or did you find her? She found me. She'd seen a series I'd done on uh, Marlena Dietrich for Esquire. And it was the days when everything was studio lit and carefully retouched and beautifully organized. And these were random photographs done on a dark sound stage while she was recording. And Marilyn adored those photographs and asked to meet me. And when we met, she said, if you did that well with Marlena, can you imagine what you can do with me? <laughs> Which I found very funny. Well, why don't we look at some of those pictures, uh, even as we talk? And we have a rather random selection. Uh, this was on the uh, uh, a film location? This was the making of the Misfits in the Nevada desert. No. And that's the back of Montgomery Cliff. This is Clark Gable. The back Gable. of Marilyn Monroe. Right. <laughs> and she's kissing Clark, Clark Gable. Gable. Why have you chosen these among, as among your favorites? It's not a matter of favorites. It's a matter of doing picture stories, of doing... It's a body of work. It's not just a single picture. It's an effort to find out what a woman is like that we're involved in here. Let's stop here. We've gone through these so quickly, we really haven't had time to, to look. What is, the, what is the camera seeing here? Is, this, is, this is the is camera Marilyn. seeing a candid, or is Marilyn intensely aware of a camera? In the at, at this moment, she isn't normally. You couldn't have a camera within 10 miles that she didn't know about. She had her own radar about it. Here, she's learning her lines. She's to do a very serious scene with Clark Gable in which she screams at murderers. And so she's trying to remember, and she's, at this point, I think, really unconscious of the camera. You have come to the conclusion now, after her death, that this is a woman who me wasn't merely good with a still camera, but was a genius? It's the one way she had of staying in the public eye. These were the days when the picture magazine was king. It was what television is today. And for her, it meant that she could sell herself in any way she chose. She was brilliant. At promotion. This was calculated then, not... Absolutely. That was not a joke. Uh, Inga Morath, the other woman who photographed her, said of her, she was the animal trainer. We, the photographers, were the beasts. Did it matter what photographer shot pictures of her? I mean... Uh, she would be as careful with a young kid, uh, you know, when, it, when she would do a public appearance and there might be thousands of kids around with cameras. She would be just as careful to pose for them as she would be for me or any other professional. You've had these pictures for 25 years, hung on to them until now. Um, why haven't you published them before this? I didn't want to believe she was dead. I was concerned about exploitation, and I will be accused of that, and it is. I saw you accused of that in the paper this yeah, morning, yeah, as a matter well, of fact. Sort of. <laughs> but more than that, I felt at this point 25 years after her death, it would have tickled her to have been still remembered like this. And the other thing is that somewhere in that 10 years that I photographed her, she said to me, remember the Marlena story? And I said, yes. And she said, remember what it was called? And I said, yes, it was called Marlena and Appreciation. And she said, someday can you do an appreciation of me? So this is it. I don't think Marilyn Monroe wanted to be forgotten. Eve Arnold, thanks. We'll be back after station break. Dodd's poetry professor, a class act. You really liked it? It was hot. Played how to look. Exactly how to bring a picture to life. Eve Arnold spent 10 years photographing Marilyn through the eyes of a camera. She watched the fresh new face become one of Hollywood's most familiar. Her latest book, Marilyn Monroe and Appreciation, pays tribute to the superstar that we saw on the screen and the woman that she knew as a friend. Your book is magnificent. Eve Arnold, but I'm interested in knowing how you met Marilyn and what your initial impressions of her were. She had asked to meet me because she'd seen some pictures that I had done of Marlena Dietrich for Esquire magazine. And when we met, she said, if you did this well with Marlena, can you imagine what you can do with me? 
I found that very funny, and I talked to my editors at Esquire. And that began a 10-year stretch during which I photographed her. Actually, it was six sessions. The shortest was two hours, and the longest was two months, during which we worked on The Misfits, the film that Arthur Miller, her then-husband, wrote for her. And your impressions of her as you met her after all that initial statement was not exactly humble. Well, I, it intrigued me. It was naive and at once very sweet and touching. It didn't bother me at all. I thought, if anybody has an ego this good, then I really want to explore it. And what did you find in her? Was she the vulnerable, uh, frightened little girl? Was she the ambitious woman knowing exactly what she wanted and how to get it? She was very sure of what she wanted. Uh, she built on the vulnerability, but it was not the salient thing about her. The interesting thing about her was that she was so steady on her focus on what was right for her that one could not do anything except admire that kind of straight, head-on bullseye. That's the target out there, and I'm going to hit it, and I'm going to be a great movie star. Actually, that was destructive in the end, I think, because as long as it was the fantasy, as long as she could believe that she was going to be the movie star, she could deal with it. When it became the reality, it was almost too much to, to bear what is, for her. What does that mean? that it was too much for her to bear, the reality? Well, the reality, suddenly the whole world was looking at her. She had so much to contend with. Uh, she, the, all the energy came from her. It, you know, all those gags and jokes and everything that happened, that came from her. All the power that was needed to run that engine that was Marilyn came from Marilyn. It wasn't anybody else's idea, and it was hard. You, as a female photographer, might have seen something a little differently from the way men uh, saw her. I wonder if that's true, because she was so flirty most of the time, at least the impressions that I read about her with men. She was so, I missed that word. Flirty. She was constantly coming oh, well, on. She, she seduced everybody. She seduced the camera, male, female, but it was the camera which was the focus. It was the still camera which really made her because these were the days uh, pre-television when the picture magazines were in their heyday and Marilyn used both the camera and the photographer to keep her public image going and that was very important to her. Eve, it suggested that she had some unusual qualities. Number one, that she had some soft down under her chin that reflected in a way that uh, was helpful to her. Number two, that she photographed 10 pounds lighter than she actually was. And number three, that she knew ways of highlighting her eyes that almost no one else knew. Are, is, is truth to this, or is this part of the myth? Yes. No, no, it's not a, it's not a myth. I wrote about it in uh, an appreciation. Uh, she knew exactly what to do. She'd studied herself from early childhood when she used to be left at the movies when her foster parents would drop her off on Saturdays to get her out of the way. She would then come back and look in the mirror and dream that she was a great star. And when she was old enough, she started applying makeup. She was a very quick study. She could learn very, very rapidly whatever it was she wanted to know. So that, yes, it's true that she was able to do things with her lips and, their, and her eyes that she kept secret from her makeup man, even. She did photograph lighter. Most people photograph 10 pounds heavier. She did it lighter. And also there was this very faint down around the periphery of the face, and it caught the light, and there was kind of a halo. It, it was softened the face and it sort of increased the look of blondness that was hers. Did you have any idea when you were filming The Misfits and doing those, those, last, those last photos of her that this was a woman in desperate trouble who might take her life? No, no. I, I knew that she had twice while we were working on the film taken an overdose of sleeping tablets. 
But my understanding at that time was the inability to sleep. That was the enemy. She could not sleep. And so she would take a couple of pills to put her out, and then she, you know, she would waken almost immediately. She would forget that she'd taken the pills, and then she would go on to more pills. But there was, look at some of the pictures in that book. And they, to me, they don't look like somebody who was about to kill herself. I don't think if it was an accident, it was misadventure, if you will. But I don't think that it was a planned suicide. Eve Arnold, as a woman who became Marilyn Monroe's friend, could she have really lived to 61? Could she have aged when she was in the limelight of that youth and beauty cult of her time? Yes, I think she certainly could have because she had the intelligence to do it. Um, there was one last interview with Life magazine in which she talked about fame, and she said, well, fame, I've had you, and you've gone by, and then proceeds to talk about herself. Yes, I think, you know, we all have to live. Some have survival instincts that are stronger than others. Uh, I don't think hers were very strong. I think that she was tired. Uh, disillusioned in many ways, felt mm. betrayed very often. So that it may have been difficult, but I don't see why she couldn't have made it. I want to thank you for being with us today. The, the book is a glorious uh, uh, memory for many of us of an absolutely wonderful looking woman. Thanks again. Thank you. In just a moment, the latest sizzling summer weather across the country with Steve Koch in Atlanta. Joining us now live in our Hollywood studios is a friend and colleague of the late Marilyn Monroe, the actor Don Murray, who worked with Marilyn on the film Bus Stop. When you were making that film with her, Don, it was after she had outgrown the starlet phase, but she wasn't yet a full-fledged star. What was she like then? I have to disagree. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. She was a full-fledged star. Uh, she had done Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, and she had done a Seven-Year Itch, and she was Hollywood's bitty, biggest star. And that's why working on Bus Stop was like working in a, in a fishbowl. I mean, everywhere you turned, you had photographers running up your back. Now, late in her life, she got the reputation of being difficult to work with, for showing up late on the set and things of that nature. Was that your experience, or was she a hardworking actress at that time? Well, she was both, actually. Uh, people that work with her on most of her films say that Bus Stop was her best behaved film, and I have to give director Josh Logan a lot of credit for that. But still, Marilyn, at her best behavior, would show up uh, for work at, uh, when she had a, for instance, a seven o'clock call, she'd show up often between 10 and 11. And uh, it was very difficult to work with her. As, as brilliant a comedian as she was, uh, getting the performance on film, you had to get it in tiny little bits because she didn't have a very long concentration span, so you'd have to cut the little pieces together to make the scenes. But I think all the, the directors uh, afterwards, after they're through with the free experience, like Billy Wilder and Josh Logan, uh, they agreed it was worth it. There are lots of beautiful actresses in Hollywood, always have been, some of them very good actresses as well as being beautiful. What made her so special? There are two things, I think. Number one is that she had this tremendous vulnerability. I think that she was not a threat to women because she had this almost childlike quality. And men, because of her vulnerability, wanted to take care of her. I think that's why she was more lasting than uh, most people personality and character-wise. The other thing was that she was a terrific comedian. Let's face it, the, the world cannot resist an adorable, beautiful clown. And that's what Marilyn was. They're very, very rare. I think Carol Lombard was one, and uh, Goldie Hawn is another, and there are very, very few of them, and I think that's one of the main reasons for her popularity. Don, thank you very much for being with us today. You're very welcome. Filming Some Like It Hot. Uh, not Some Like It Hot. Uh, we're having a heat wave, a tropical heat wave, which is uh, no business like show business. And I remember uh, DiMaggio was on the set that day, and Marilyn must have been very nervous she fell during the dance number and came over and apologized to us and afterwards invited us back to the dressing room and s talked about the fact that she hoped she'd be able to come to New York and study acting, which we figured she was just being polite. And indeed, she showed up about two years later at to study with my dad and kind of became... Marilyn adopted families. I think that she was always 
looking for something that she probably hadn't had when she was young. And so that we roomed together on Fire Island one summer. She identified enormously with my brother Johnny, who was three years younger than me, because he was not acting as I was. And she felt that he was left out of the family. So for his 18th birthday, she gave him a present of her red Thunderbird, which is a pretty nice present. And we were in acting class together. I saw her do the work at the actor's studio where she was really lovely. She, uh, you know, it's interesting. Do you know anything about astrology? Or well, you may not believe in it. You could know about it. Not. Are, do you know anything about astrology, Larry? Well, I read it. I hear about it, uh, talk oh. about it. And I have close friends who totally believe in it. Yeah, I, uh, it's not even that I believe in it. It's just that it's worked for me. Marilyn was a Gemini with Leo rising. And I, I do numerology. My friend Sidney Omar, the great astrologer, has been teaching me some numerology. Marilyn had a seven birth path, which, by the way, is the same as Oliver North. Um, Meaning what? I'm so, a Scorpio with Libra rising. What does that mean? Nobody's perfect. Thanks a lot, Scott Berg. No, no, I'll do it later. So I, I can do number readings. So I'll do it later. But what uh, are, what, all right, meaning what? So what it meant was that with that seven birth path, she tended, it was wonderful, by the way, for film, television, illusion. The negative side of that would be the tendency to be too hard on herself, self-deception, and that the, the need for some kind of spiritual uh, base or spiritual why, values. Why she, and all substance abuse also. In other words, uh, there's a tendency on the negative side of that, that because the people get very lonely and okay. have big was, emotional ups and downs. Yeah. Was she a talent? Oh, yes. Was she a yeah. good actress? Yes. Why then do we hear so much that she was not, that she was tough to live with, that she had to do scenes 2,300 times? And that doesn't mean having to do a scene over and over again or being difficult to live with has nothing to do with whether or not you're good. It just means that there are some actors who do it well on the first right. take. She, she, had, she was so self-critical, so overly demanding of herself, so insecure. Uh, and it was something somehow that she had not dealt with, but it's interesting. She got herself on the stage of the actor's studio, which has got to be harder than getting up, uh, let's say, on film, because there's no chance to do it over again. So that uh, the fact that she could do that, that she had the guts or the courage, yeah. in a way, I see her as being really before her time almost was, one of the first women following women's lib. Was her the, forte uh, hmm. light comedy? I, that's probably what uh, she's done the most, but if you think about it, Bus Stop was not like comedy. Misfits was not like comedy. And she had a wonderful sense of humor, but she also, I think, had that ability with a lot, a lot of, look at Chaplin. Great comics have the ability to make you laugh or cry, and almost simultaneously, I think that Marilyn had that, because the thing that was funny and touching was that underneath the, the humor was the longing the pathos, the, the desire for something more. And I believe, listen, there have been an, a million blondes, glamorous, not glamorous, better bodies, straighter noses. The thing I feel that's made Marilyn uh, last is the some way that we've identified with all of her longing, the unfulfilled longing, that she somehow not only expressed in, in her parts, but that she expressed in her interviews. Susan, in other words, yeah. Yeah. Did her death make her last? By that I mean, had yes. she lived, would Marilyn Monroe be a major figure in the world of entertainment today at age 61? Would she have been Elizabeth you Taylor? Would she have been more than that? Was possibly. death part of the mystique and you the know, way she died? That question is y yes and no. <laughs> in other words, it's uh, I can't second-guess destiny. If she had gone ahead with the things that she was planning when she died, which was to go to do things with my father in the theater, to, to uh, do some television things of some classical things, Anna Christie, what she was working on, uh, it's possible that she would have had a career and been working. However, the irony of it is that she who wanted so desperately to be taken seriously is taken more seriously, not just as, as an artist, but as a human being because of the tragic death. And I guess that's often the, the irony, that yeah. we appreciate death makes us honor something that we aren't able to see when someone's now, alive. Now we have so. chocolate bars. There's a Maryland bar out. 
a bunch of new books, posters, yeah. shoes, Marilyn Monroe shoes, well, a lot Marilyn of people, Monroe yeah. handbags. Now, the people buying this were probably not alive when she died. A lot of them. You know, a lot of the, uh, and uh, yet How do you account for that? Why would a 19-year-old American female be interested in Marilyn Monroe? There still hasn't been anyone like her. Can you think of anybody who has that kind of charismatic pull for people? Or, I think that the thing about Marilyn was she said, look, this is what I am, but look at me. I have a heart, a soul. I have something else. See me, love me, care for me. And that's a universal, mm. universal longing, I think, for all women. Whether they knew her or not, somehow she's come to represent the woman who wanted to be acknowledged beyond the looks for what she was you, uh, uh, in her core. You wrote a very honest, wonderful autobiography called Bittersweet. Uh, mm -hmm. And I know you're writing another book. We look forward to having you on when that comes this out. This one's really honest. <laughs> <laughs> called In My Father's House will be the next mm -hmm. one. Um, and therefore, you, uh, being honest, will be able to tell us if uh, the relationships with the Kennedys involving Miss Monroe were true, and secondarily, did she talk about it a lot? Uh, yes and no. Well answered. She didn't talk about it a lot. <laughs> Both were true. Mm. Are you uh, concerned over the questions of her death? You know, I think even, uh, I believe in reincarnation, so I believe that the soul doesn't die, that we learn what we have to, and then we go on to the next, the next role, if you will. I, uh, had some contact with Marilyn shortly after she died, and, uh, through, through a medium, uh -huh. and at which time, this was way before all of the things that have been uncovered now, and at which time she said that there had been some facts about her death that had not come out, but that she really preferred it to be forgotten. In other words, what happens is people have gotten so involved with this mystery that's never going to be resolved. I think Marilyn would have said, hey, wait a minute, fellas, remember me, what I gave, what I contributed, you know, because her life did make a statement in a way, even the tragic, the tragic aspects of her life. It's almost like that in the tragedy of that, that was a gift she gave of herself to the world in a way. She helped a lot of other people who said, God, if Marilyn Monroe feels this way, then maybe I'm not crazy. Yeah. If she wants more, if having the money and the fame and the looks isn't enough, then maybe the fact that I'm questioning my life, I'm not alone. So it seems yeah. to me the, that she would have wanted that remembered, not... I mean, we can get all involved. You know, it's everybody. Uh, let's get some calls in. Susan Strasberg's our guest, Catalina Island, California. Hello. Hi, Larry. Yes. Uh, some of us remember that when Marilyn Monroe died, she was an object of scorn and ridicule in a lot of the magazines. The week she died, one by Luella Parsons, I remember, would have killed me off. Just completely would have devastated Marilyn. What do you think of the people that, that really held a lot of responsibility toward her if it was a suicide? Marilyn had, it was a pattern of hers. Uh, that she, she didn't drink, by the way, she loved champagne, she didn't drink other things. And like Judy Garland, like some of the other people who now are coming out and getting help for their problems, remember in those days you didn't talk about, about these things. You know, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I, I mean, I, I don't judge anybody uh, in, in that sense. And Marilyn wasn't a victim any more than any of us is a victim. Uh, and I don't think, I, I feel she didn't see herself as that. She wouldn't have wanted to be remembered as that. In fact, she was, she was doing more than surviving. When she died, she had bought a house and made that commitment for the first time in her life. Remember, she was showing me all the, the Mexican furniture that she bought. She'd gone over the border, and I still have a, a blue, a large blue kind of uh, ashtray that she, that she had bought for herself. She was making professional plans that she was excited about. She had loved that she had lost the weight and was in, in good shape again, so she did. By the way, did your father tell you whether or not he thought she would be good on stage? Well, he saw her. You see, we saw her uh, at the actor's studio. I know, but did he think she pulled off a Broadway play well? Yes. Yes, he, because remember also that uh, she didn't have to play the largest musical comedy house in, in town, 
look at the theaters now. There are beautiful, smaller theaters. And she, she filled the actor's studio, which is a small theater. In other words, she oh. had a luminous quality on stage that that's was not I, thin, that was really full and, and very ripe. Mitchellville, Maryland, for Susan Strasberg. Hello. Yes, good evening. Hi. In most Hi. of Marilyn Monroe's films, she usually portrayed an airhead. Was she really like that in real life, or was she a sensitive, intelligent person? Oh, she, this was a bright lady. No, she was... You know, a lot of that, the image that Marilyn got stuck in was because she played into it. You know, the, the difficulty with being an actor is we all want approval. So we do certain things for approval, and we get applause, and then we try and break away from that image, and people suddenly say, hey, wait a minute. She used to be so cute and sexy and bouncy. We don't want her to be serious. I remember, as a matter of fact, Bette Midler once telling me that when she came on stage and did something serious in the last show that she did, she felt hostility from the audience. So what was the question? Was Marilyn bright? Was she bright? Yes. She, had, she was well-read. She was bright. Remember that emotional stability has nothing to do with intellectual mm. brightness okay she was bright she had a kind of street smart she was very perceptive about people you know often we can know things about other people and not take care of ourselves in some way i think that the way she fooled herself the most was in thinking that she could handle the uh the pills i blame that on the doctors a lot did because she I uh, think did she hold her own with arthur miller I don't know what her own was. Well, intellectually, in that relationship, I Did mean. he hold his own with her? But again, you know, we're talking about in a relationship, what I've just said is that intellectuals are not necessarily the most centered, grounded, or happiest people in the world. So very often, uh, some of the smart... Einstein said, uh, imagination's more important than knowledge. And if it's good enough for Einstein, it's good enough for well, me. Well, Miller so. wrote a play about her that... Uh, yes. ...that she must have been angered at after the fall, right? She, he wrote that after her death, shortly afterwards. I think she probably would have been disturbed, but, you know, he's an artist, so I guess he has the right to tell his side of the story. It was very one-sided, it was very subjective, but probably so was the way I mm. saw Marilyn. I saw her through my eyes, my needs, pr the way Gloria Steinem saw her, the way Norman Mailer saw her. We all, we don't see her yeah, the way our, she our was. Our looking her, glass, huh? exa The way we want to Tampa, Florida. Tampa for Susan Strasberg. Hello. Hello. Yes. Hi. Uh, calling from Tampa, Florida. I know. Go ahead. We've heard a lot about the Kennedys, both Robert oh. and John. They played an important role about rumors involving her death and her personal life. Just how much were they involved in her personal life? Well, Susan says they were, but she didn't talk about it a lot. Anything you could add, Susan? Uh, yes, and I'd rather not, because it doesn't really seem important, you know. It's, it, it almost gets to be like long-range gossip, and there have been so many books... ...about it a lot. Anything you could add, Susan? Uh, yes, and I'd rather not, because it doesn't really seem important, you know. It's, it, it almost gets to be like long-range gossip, and there have been so many books, and it's been done to death that I really... Uh, you know, I guess in the end, what's important for those of us who act or teach or, or write, as I do, is uh, the effect we've had on other people's lives, possibly. And uh, I think, you know, Marilyn's work stands for itself. The personal life, um, she, by sharing her personal life with all of us, okay, and by, you know, by sharing her pain, her sorrows, her, which she did in the interview. She was very open, very free in talking about these things. She talked about what she wanted to talk about. She didn't talk about the Kennedys, so I guess she didn't want to talk about them, so that I, uh, even in, in the book, uh, when I wrote Bittersweet, I really didn't go into it.